I now have the pleasure to introduce the, uh, the first keynote speaker of the event this year, is the Right Honourable John Gummer, Lord Deben. Lord Deben was the longest serving Secretary of State for the environment the UK has ever had. His 16 years of top level ministerial experience include Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, Minister for London, Employment Minister and Paymaster General in Her Majesty's Treasury. In 200 years, only five others have held so long a period of office. His experience as an international negotiator has earned him worldwide respect, both in the business community and among environmentalists. In consecutive years, the BBC unprecedentedly awarded him the title of parliamentarian who did most for the environment internationally, while the NGO community called him the best environment secretary we've ever had. He has consistently championed an identity between environmental concerns and business sense. And to that end, he set up and now runs Sancroft, a corporate responsibility consultancy working with blue chip companies around the world on environmental, social and ethical issues. Now since leaving office, he's been chairman of the Marine Stewardship Council, chairman of the International Commission on Sustainable Consumption and non-executive director of KID PLC. In December 2005, David Cameron appointed him chairman of the Quality of Life Commission, and their report, Blueprint for a Green Economy, was launched in September 2007. He's currently chairman of the Climate Change Committee, chairman of Valpac Limited, chairman of the Association of Professional Financial Advisors, chairman of Veolia UK Limited, and non-executive director of the Castle Trust Limited. <coughs> May I please welcome the Right Honourable John Gummer, Lord Deben. Well, Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to add my welcome to our capital city, which is becoming the world city and I hope very much that you will enjoy your visit here. It's uh, an exciting time for the gas industry, and for me it's of great interest because some of my earliest memories involve the gas industry. Uh, I went in for a competition at the age of eight when the gas industry in Britain was nationalised. Uh, and I won the competition uh, on a short article of the wonderful phrase, what Mr. Thurm does for gas, and uh, spent a week in Mosney in Ireland with my family and discovered what it was like to eat real food for the first time, as we had been entirely rationed up to that date. And then when I first left school and was on my way to university, I, I went on one of those courses that the gas industry ran to try to encourage people to join it. So you had a very, very slim escape. Uh, then I went to university and ever since have dealt very considerably with the whole issue of energy. Uh, and, and one of the things that really concerns me is the way in which there is a continuous battle between absolutism and diversity. There are those for whom their excitement of one form of energy is against another make them almost determined to suggest that that's the only form. Whether it's uh, renewables in general, gas, coal, oil, or particular renewables, uh, tidal, water, air, photovoltaics. There's a determination, an exciting determination, to promote a particular way of solving the energy needs of this and other countries. And against that is a growing determination to ensure that we have diversity of supply and that that diversity of supply is necessary in the world in which we now live. And as chairman of the Committee on Climate Change, I'm responsible for setting the budgets and targets which will enable the United Kingdom to reach its committed 
a reduction in emissions of 80% by the year 2050. And we have a program which is already up to 2027 of the budgets which will have to be met. It's a very unusual form set down by the Climate Change Act in this country, setting up a committee which is entirely independent of government, which has duties enshrined in legislation to which the government must adhere. And its members are independent and are not subject to uh, being sacked by the Prime Minister, something which in Australia our equivalent didn't manage to protect. So uh, we have a unique role. But I'm pleased to say that what we're doing is being copied all over the world. And I think the first thing that uh, this conference will want to consider is that in countries as far apart as Korea and uh, the United States, uh, between uh, California and China, the inexorable march of climate change legislation is now a feature in almost every market. Not all in the same way, and not all with the same strength, not all with the same commitment. But uh, every year, GLOBE, uh, an organization of which I'm privileged to be the chairman, the Association of the Environment Agencies of each of the parliaments, the environment groups of each of the parliaments, produces a report on the legislation on climate change. It started off with 12 nations. It went to 20. Last year, it was 33. Next year, it will be 66. 66 of the major nations of the world, all of them, dealing with climate change in a serious manner. And that is a sensible thing to remind ourselves of at the beginning of this great conference, not least because we have had in this week the report of the IPCC. And it is worth reminding ourselves of what that report is and its seriousness. This is not just another report by another body. It is a report which has been signed unanimously by all the major countries in the world and most of the minor ones. They have committed themselves to what is in that report line for line and word for word. And the reason that that has been possible is that they gathered together all the best climate scientists and insisted that every single bit of report, whether favorable towards a view that climate was changing or a contrary view, should be thoroughly investigated. Anything that had been peer reviewed has been deeply considered. And indeed, there are 9,000 exemplars quoted in the report itself. And even the shortened version, there are two shortened versions. There's one of short, short, which is a couple of pages, and there's one of slightly longer of 38 pages. Even, even these have been climbed over and looked at and checked by the whole range so that these come to you as unanimous. So the one thing that we can say is that the science is settled. It doesn't mean to say that there are some people who wish it weren't and will come forward with all sorts of sayings, well, why did you, what about this? What about Mr. So-and-so? What about his view? The answer to that is that his view and Mr. So-and-so's and the rest are all being considered. And this is the result of that consideration. And therefore, to suggest that this report does not ring true demands a degree of credulity which is not sensible for a businessman or for anyone of intellectual capacity. 
And we have to recognize, therefore, that all these countries have signed up to a proposition that they will take action in order to avoid dangerous climate change. They have signed up to a proposition that says that most climate change has, in fact, been caused by human beings and that there is a very clear increase in temperatures, not only on land but in the sea, which leads most people to see that we are in very dangerous territory. The sea has increased in acidification by 30% in the last 150 years, making changes of enormous effect. And the reason for that, the amount of CO2 that we've shoved into it in our activities. And we have, therefore, to recognize that the first element in the business parameters which we will be concerned with is that nations will be dealing with climate change, some less well, some more adventurously, but ever more clearly as the effects of climate change become not those of the future, but those of the present. If you're in Palau or the Marshall Islands, if you're in Bangladesh, the immediate effects of climate change are such that you can't think of anything without bearing that in mind. And if you want to see the clarity, you see it in China, who are now going down a road more ambitious than any other country in the world, totally committed to the fact that climate change will in fact wholly disrupt their economy unless they change the way in which they generate, electri uh, generate energy and maintain their growth. Growth is not contrary to dealing with climate change, for climate change can provide the basis for a new green economy. That's not just the view of the British government and the British opposition, it's the view of the government of Singapore, it's the view of the government of South Korea, of China, of many of the states of the United States, and now of the President of the United States. Even in countries whose reaction is surprising and to be deplored, like Canada, many of the Canadian provinces are behaving properly. And one day, even that government will understand that science can't be silenced by abolishing the science minister, which is its latest step to stop the discussion taking place. And of course, it operates within a world which itself is causing huge difficulties. We live in a world in which there will be, in the very near future, nine billion people. And one billion of those will be additional middle-class people able to make choices, demanding energy, demanding the products of energy, wishing to live as so many of us have been fortunate enough to live for so many generations. And there will also be in every one of the countries a desire for energy sovereignty because energy is too important to be put on one side and become the reliance upon another nation. I put it in my own terms. I don't want my children to be dependent upon Mr. Putin's children, not because I think his children are in any way unpleasant. I simply think power should be spread and not concentrated. And then I have to deal with climate change. So, what we in Britain see is that we are in the business of insurance. If I were to ask this whole audience, will anyone who doesn't insure his house against fire please put his or her hands up? Is there anyone here who doesn't insure his house against fire? Well, it looks like nobody. 
And yet, you're spending on average, on British terms anyway, about £140 a year to defend yourself against fire. And yet there is a 99.8% chance that your house won't burn down. You do it because of the disastrous effect if it did burn down. We are now presented with a situation in which uh, there is a 95% chance that climate change is happening, we are causing it, and it will become a danger to the future of our planet. And so the relatively small insurance cost, which this year in Britain is £60 a year for an average family. By the year 2000, it'll be £100 a year. And if we get the carbon intensity target for which I fight, it will add another £20 to that between 2020 and 2030, after which the diversified portfolio of energy provision will, in fact, begin comparatively to lower prices. It's at that point that I say, I never believe in people who tell me that if only you do this, you're going to have lower prices. Not only don't I believe that, but all the public opinion poll shows that nobody believes it. And if you're as old as I am, you certainly don't, because I remember when the advertisements on the tubes suggested that if we had nuclear power, then there would be no point in giving us a bill so cheap it would be. And the truth is that we always underestimate the cost and overestimate the advantages of any fuel that is new. Which brings me to fracked gas. <clears throat> I'm not opposed to fracking. Uh, as long as the proper environmental rules are laid down. I look with some dismay in the industries in some countries who are trying to get the rules changed so that they will be able to frack with less uh, care. I hope every government in the world will ensure that that doesn't happen. Uh, but uh, having said I'm in favour of frack gas, I do like to work on the science and the facts. And I think we'll have to understand that the amount of fracked gas that we will manage in the United Kingdom is likely to be considerably less than the enthusiasts suggest. That's partly the fact that the Almighty has ensured that much of the best gas is under much of the most beautiful countryside in Britain. And given how hard we've found it to get the British to take to onshore wind, with uh, graceful uh, towers uh, and uh, not unpleasant uh, turb turbines. Uh, the idea that we're going to be able to get them to agree to large installations moving every year a few hundred yards in the South Downs seems to me only possible if you don't know about the British planning system and you don't recognise that these are conservative held seats by people who want to be returned. So it's going to be a tough time getting permission to do what is a tougher operation in Britain uh, than it is in the United States, not least because we don't have the distant places where fracking can go on without anybody much minding, nor do we have the gas in the same geological formation that they have in the United States, it's much more expensive, much more difficult, and much more limited to extract. But having said that, we will need gas, and we will want gas, in order to meet our targets uh, in Britain for many years to come. So I find it uh, perfectly acceptable to come to you and welcome the opening of the 26th World LP Gas Forum because you have an important role to play in ensuring the energy needs of the coming years. Her Royal Highness rightly pointed to the special 
but remarkable contribution you make in countries where the mere production of energy is a threat to health, uh, to life, and to the environment. The clean energy which you provide is a major step forward in many nations. And indeed, in the United States, because of the switch to gas, for that nation, not only is there greater sovereignty, but there is also an improvement in the emissions. The trouble is, that improvement is only partial. And I would like to leave this industry with three important aims. The first is, it is important to ensure that the production, distribution, and use of LPG is as environmentally friendly as it possibly can be. That because it's better than the worst kind of coal doesn't mean that there aren't lots of opportunities to making it better still. Not just directly, not just what happens with flaring, not just what happens with transport, but of course of how it's used in the home and in factories, the efficiency with which it is used, the industry has a huge advantage to be gained from making this, of all fossil fuels, the preferred one. And the second is this. We will come to a time in which gas will not be able to be used unless there is carbon capture and storage. And there is a real criticism which has to be levied at the industry, at the small amount of efforts being placed in ensuring that CCS becomes a reality and not merely something which works on the drawing board. We need to have carbon capture and storage, and it is essential for your industry that we have it or all over the country, as we increase the amount of uh, energy coming from uh, other sources, from renewable sources, and maybe, I think probably, from uh, the various forms uh, of uh, atomic energy, then gas will increasingly be unfavoured. Whereas if gas can be used without damaging the uh, climate, you have a very long-term advantage and one which you should look forward to with enthusiasm. The gas industry does have in its hands its own future in a way which practically no other industry does. But there are too many within this industry who take one of two easy way out. They say, they'll need us for my lifetime. I'll be retired by the time the problems of carbon capture and storage arise. So for me, I'll put that off. And the other is, well, I suppose climate change is happening, but governments will not have the uh, guts, won't have the power to make the steps which will put our industry in the spotlight and we'll get away with it. Well, the first is a matter of time. But anyone here who's got a concern for their children must recognise that they have in their hands one of the most powerful ways of protecting their children's future. And if there is one thing which we will be judged, it will be whether we have taken those steps which are demanded of us. Some of you will believe that that judgment will come from yourself and your children. Some of us believe that that judgment will be something greater 
and more frightening. But few of us should leave our, lead our lives without remembering that the question of, well, what were you doing, Daddy, when these decisions were made? It's a question that we have avoided. But lastly, we have to accept that long-term planning is now going to be a central part of the major economies of the world. The long-term planning for energy, to give energy security, to avoid dangerous climate change, and to ensure that we have the resources to feed, clothe, and uh, uh, shelter nine billion people. And the excitement of that is that you are at the heart of those answers. And if governments are going to make the right decisions, given the IPCC report, given the certainty of the science, if they're going to make the right decisions, they need you to make the right advice, or they will make the wrong decisions. You should never leave the future of your business in the hands of elected members of parliament. I was one for 40 years. I now sit in the House of Lords as a legislator. I have to say to you, I want business to be in charge of its own future because you are likely to make the best answers. But you will not make those answers unless you accept from now that climate change is real, we are causing it, it is dangerous and it is disruptive. And if your children are to live in a world in which peace is possible, in which prosperity is available, in which people do not fear for their futures, then you have to make the decisions now. And you have to make those decisions which ensure that the gas industry and that part of it which is represented here today has a future as the provider first of a less carbon intensive uh, fuel and ultimately as a non-carbon intensive fuel. And it is the movement of the one to the other which will ensure the prosperity of your businesses and those who seek to stop it, those who use delaying tactics, those who will not make the necessary investment, they are the people that will destroy this industry. It is the innovators, those who have bothered to come to this conference to be at the forefront of change. It is you who will protect your industry and in doing so will ensure the future for your children and grandchildren. Thank you very much.